during the Civil War series, we came across a quote from William Faulkner that said, history is not was, but is. Um, it resonated then, and I think in this one, we began to understand, perhaps more than any other film, that when we think of the past, we think of something distant and remote of different generations of people now mostly gone, uh, and that, that is somehow not present in any way. I think it's really clear for the people here that memory is this incredibly present thing, that uh, the death of Rena Marie, which took place so many, many decades ago, happened just then as they recounted it. And I think the great gift of the, the human drama, the poetry of the so-called ordinary people, is in the fact that they made the experience of the Dust Bowl present for us, and hopefully we can take its lessons. I'd like to introduce my colleagues. This is Julie Dunphy, a producer of the film. This is Dayton Duncan, a writer, and the writer and producer of the film. And we've worked together uh, for about 30 years. And, uh, I thought I would give Dayton and Julie a chance if they wanted to just say something just this is the really the first time out uh, with the crowd. We're heading to the Dust Bowl in a couple of weeks to show the survivors uh, of our film as well as the Dust Bowl uh, uh, what we've done. Uh, but they, 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 well, I'd just like to say as the, as the writer of it, um, on the topic that uh, we had talked about for many years of wanting to do, um, my great fear was that we were too late that we weren't going to be able to find people who lived through it uh, to tell us their stories. It, it's still a compelling story, and obviously Caroline Henderson, and you didn't really get to meet a little bit of Sonora, and you didn't really get to meet Howard Finnell, and newspaper art, you know, that you could tell the story of the Dust Bowl uh, without them, but uh, it was important to us to try to try to have the people who actually lived through that. Um, and to, uh, I want to just honor Julie and uh, co-producer named Susan Shoemaker, uh, who used a variety of techniques. Ken was on air in Oklahoma television and others, inviting people to send their photographs and their stories. And Julie put ads in newspapers, went to nursing homes, uh, historical societies, and met several hundred people. And, pre-interviewed them and got photographed but also collected the stories uh, for us to choose from those who, the two dozen who, uh, who really uh, animate our story. The interesting thing, thing for me when we were interviewing them is, as Ken said, how real it was, but also these are people in their late 80s and sometimes in their 90s and four of them have now passed away, but they're kids' memories. Um, and so it's filtered through that, you know, childish, not childish, but childhood memory which is actually a little more hopeful. And it's only Caroline Henderson's adult voice that sometimes you really get to understand the worries uh, that the parents must have had during the whole time. But without those people that uh, Julie found, we certainly couldn't have the film that we did. You know, I talked to, I would call up nursing homes in places like Amarillo, Texas, figuring that people had come in from rural areas to maybe join the younger generation in the city. But we also, um, we were in touch with historical societies out in the panhandle. You know, I just we would call people up and say, who are your, who are your old people? What are, what are your stories? You know, who's floating around out there? And, and we had incredible cooperation. We're all still very attached to all these people. I'm looking forward to seeing a lot of them. And we just lost Wayne about a week and a half ago. And his family, um, we're all planning to join him in Goodwill, Oklahoma, to see the clips we're going to show the survivors. And they're all still planning to come. And to show you how much this project has meant to the survivors, they're planning to hold his funeral um, while they're there. For, mm -hmm. um, and, in, and all four of the people um, who we lost in the last year, um, being a part of this was written with their obituary. And a lot of them, their children have said to us, we didn't know those stories. Thank you so much. You know, for somehow they were able to tell them to us things they never shared with their children. In fact, uh, the guy who is not him <laughs> was actually the first to pass. 
when we knew he was in trouble. Yeah, I was. <laughs> He passed about a year ago, um, just, a, just a year ago, and we had a rough cut of the film at the time. He happened to have retired to Exeter, his only child, Exeter, New Hampshire, his only child lived there. And so um, I, I can't remember which order. One of us went over um, and showed him episode one along with his daughter and a few other people in the assisted living facility he was in. And then a week later, we showed him episode two, still in a rough stage, but enough for him to, to understand the story and see his role in it. Um, and then he died about a week later. Mm -hmm. And um, the morning of his funeral, his daughter, um, who's a retired chemistry teacher, very technologically able and capable, called me up and said, I'm trying to make the cut. Oh, let me back up a minute. We gave every survivor a DVD copy of their unedited interview to share with their family and friends because we knew we were going to lose a couple along the way. Anyway, his daughter called me up and said, I can't make a copy of the DVD of his, his unedited interview. I keep trying and something's not working. I thought, well, you know, she's obviously frazzled. It's the morning of her father's funeral. I said, well, Linda, what are you trying to do? And she said he wanted to be buried with his interview, and I want to have a copy. At which point I said, we will make you a copy. <laughs> Well, thank you all for a very moving and uh, revelatory um, film, which I hope its lesson will be learned by our generation. But now this question is uh, directed to Ken Burns. Um, you've made so many uh, documentaries on, on so many different aspects of American history, and I was wondering if there is any one central theme uh, that unites them all and is also present in, in this film. Well, I, I, and that's a very good thing, and, and I would have to say again that, that when you attribute them to me, you're, you're also have to attribute them to Dayton and Julie and other people that are not on this platform. Um, we feel like we've made the same film over and over again, and that that film asks one deceptively simple question, who are we, who are these strange and complicated people who like to call themselves Americans? And you never answer that film. You hopefully deepen it with each successive project, and I think we have done that. And obviously, you engage themes of what the nature of freedom is, uh, what the human experience is, both its Americanness and its universality, because there are aspects of this story that don't need the hubris or the exceptionalism of uh, the American narrative superimposed over their, uh, their aspects, their, their, their innate to human beings, wherever you might find them. Um, and we're always constantly interested in that that sort of dimension in which history reminds us that the more things change, the more they stay the same. That these, the impulse towards, uh, you know, uh, boom and bust, the, the bubbles, and all of the things that we're dealing with now are the themes of, of prohibition, the last film, the themes of this. Uh, almost all the films had some. Uh, strange and eerie resonance uh, with today, and that's the great glory. I mean, it also is um, pessimistic, too. You want human beings to grow up, to learn some of these lessons, and uh, more often than not, we do not, and that is an aspect of it. But for us, the human dimension, and, and when I say freedom, I don't necessarily just mean it in a political way. It could be a spiritual way, but it could just be an individual way, that it, it, it reminds us of the glories that we all share and have uh, as a result of this birthright, but also the accompanying responsibilities. And for us, uh, we, we sort of think we're making the same film over again, and it's just a chance to practice uh, with another set of stories. Uh, and, and that is essentially it, that those stories have a kind of infinite variety in their sameness, in their humanness. And that's, uh, I think, what keeps us going. They're really good stories, and that's all it is. It's, we're just drawn to good stories. Thank you all for giving us a sneak preview of this. Yeah, and, and then the other thing, this is just less than a quarter of the film. <laughs> and I kept, we, we were dying in the back going, oh no, you don't know about this. And you didn't know about this. <laughs> <laughs> 
when Dayton does bring the first draft, which is huge, it's sort of like packing up all the ideas, all the stories, all the people. He had an anxiety that that there was there are too many people and that we'd be weeding out. I don't think we weeded out any but one, and that it all became a question of how you could boil down each of those stories into a manageable way that you could tell in the context, the rhythm, the pacing, the demands of the film. I mean, that's been our method. But what what you were exposed to is their humanness and the stories they had to tell and the power of Green and Marie. And the foresters you meet are, have an unbelievable story that we didn't share this time, hoping that we can entice you to look at the whole film. <laughs> Filmmaking was always saying, we know what it is, let's impose this structure. We have these commercial interruptions, so we have to build this artificially to certain breaks. In public television, we don't have that, and we have that ability to just sort of let the stuff marinate and subdue and figure out where our sympathies are and how we're moved by this and how much of a learning curve we're on and how much we have to catch up to uh, the story and to then take their, the initial stuff we've gotten there to go out to places like here and other archives to find the material that'll help tell the rest of the story. Um, and that's, that's what gets us up in the morning. It is, it's fun, it's hard, extraordinarily hard work and the cutting room floor is filled with stuff that you would look at and go, that's good scenes. Not bad scenes. Pretty well written. <laughs> 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 Franz Joseph has the nerve to say too many notes. <laughs> saying too many notes for a long time. I watch my back a lot. <laughs> I like the analogy of closer. <laughs> Do you put that extra stuff in DVD sets now, the stuff that formerly was tossed? Can you put that out? Uh, yeah, for the last 10 or 15 years. And I have to say um, that at the beginning I hated that because one of the reasons why I am so wedded to public television, why I love it so much, is that every single film that we've made I can call a director's cut. You know what I mean? And that, there are very few filmmakers that have that ability to say, this is the film we wanted to make. And yes, it's non standard length or whatever. Um, now, uh, and so, so that's what it is. Even if you've had that difficult task in the editing room of sawing off a right arm, and Dave and I have a dreadful story from Mark Twain of taking out, literally, I took out one of the best scenes we had because it actually disrupted the longer form. But it was, in a, if you looked at the scene, as you can, it's fantastic. But uh, what happens is, is that the DVD extras um, are a wonderful way to begin that question of access to process that you asked, um, but also keeps your writer is <coughs> mollified. <laughs> and then also, uh, PBS has a very vibrant website, uh, and all of our films have their own place there on it. And so, besides the DVD extras for the DVDs that we would encourage you to buy uh, on the on the website itself, it's also uh, going to be some things with uh, more of the interviews with the people that you know that, that you know we just can't put everything in, but they had interesting things to say that uh, that are worth people uh, being able to, uh, to see. And some of those things that I mentioned uh, that won't be on the DVD extras, but will be drop scenes that will be on the website. So there, those, those things are. Fun. It's a difficult triage. Not horrible, it's difficult because you do have to give up. You know, in, in newspaper business, it's the editor says, you know, and kill the little darling. It's the sentence that you're, you're, you're uh, most enamored of. And, and we end up having to make some really, really difficult choices uh, when we do this to make the larger thing better and still are demanding. Uh, films that require your full attention. We hope that we can reward your full attention, and I emphasize full, uh, by, the, by the quality of that. But a lot of that requires also making some difficult choices, and being able to have them on the website of the DVD is, is sort of a saving place. Hi, my name is Kathy Nelson, and I work for the National Family Farm Coalition. I'm really appreciate you telling these stories, and we've been working with many farmers who tell us stories that we never 
been able to get some of the depth of, of the history sort of out there. There have been other documentaries in the past, but one question I have, I and mean, one comment is just how important it seems to be to elevate when there was an appropriate government role and what kind of policies were put in place. And we're in the midst right now of a farm bill debate where some of the very kinds of programs that have been in place are being jeopardized in the name of budget cuts or shifting priorities or whatever. And so one question is, knowing that November is when this is going to air in PBS, between now and then, is it going to be airing in other formats with this kind of um, it, it will be like this. Or? It will be like this uh, around the country in, in clips and, and, and parts of it and having a discussion. Our intention is not to try to influence the political question, but to offer people not only now leading up to this election, but beyond that with some of the ways in which the pendulums do swing politically, uh, some of the ways in which human beings can easily forget the lessons of the past and, and, yeah. and repeat them uh, again. And it is, I think, uh, this film is a, is, is a testament, as Dayton was articulating before, to the fact that it is very facile in political discussions, particularly in the abstract, to speak about less or more government. Um, when you go to history and you run up about up against examples of crises or circumstances, um, then you've got the, that's where the rubber hits the road, and there you find uh, whether that that government is as pernicious as you to believe, or as benevolent as you've been to believe. And I think that's the great gift of historical exploration. It's not as loaded as freighted with the contemporary political arguments. It's a table history that is is a table around which we can still have a more or less civil conversation. It's getting even more and more difficult because sometimes that over politicization goes backwards into time and condemns people who, you know, who thought for a while were pretty good and are on Mount Rushmore. Uh, and uh, and uh, tends to elevate other people who we thought were pretty bad. And uh, so, you know. Uh, if you have an organization or, or a venue that, that between now and then that you would love to have one or one of us, or uh, you know, come to show excerpts. You know, we would certainly consider that. We, you know, part of what we hope to do. You know, uh, we love working with PBS, and uh, but the, you know, we don't. Have, there's no real big advertising. But the only way that we can try to encourage more people to watch our broadcast when it is broadcast in November is to do the shoe leather of going out and doing events like this to try to at least perk your interest and hopefully when it is broadcast that you know millions of Americans will tune into it. So you know if you can contact us if we certainly consider it. That's it. <laughs>